big flight ahead of him. Justin Marshall joins us. 81 test veteran of the All Blacks. He'll be working for Super Sport and keeping in touch with us at the World Cup turn will be at Tookers for that South African All Black test this weekend. Justin, welcome back, mate. Yeah, good afternoon to you, Marty. Let's start with the Shield Challenge. Hut Rick, what did you think of it? I really enjoyed it. It was absolutely fabulous. Look, it had a, obviously it was a provincial game, but it had a real club feel to it as well. Um, it was really nice to go along there, just be able to walk into the stadium, see people just wandering their way in. Um, and yeah, both sides went out there and approached the game like it was, like it should have been approached as if it was at uh, the Cape Town. And um, oh, it was a really good afternoon, actually. It was good fun. Good to take the game back to the level that we spoke about last week and, and people to really embrace it. And the players did as well. Yeah, well, you'll be away then. You won't see this one this coming Wednesday. I mean, it's going to be a cracking match. Wellington won't want to give it up. And I love the fact that Tasman as a franchise have never won it. So that adds extra spice. Mm. Oh, it certainly does. You know, like the Rams really Shield's got such incredible history. Um, you know, there's no doubt about the fact that when you're, when you're in your new province like Tasman, um, you, you want to be able to be that side that gets the Rams really Shield for the first time. They haven't been able to cross that bridge yet. Um, they've got some, a very good side, full of determined players. Not a great result for them. No, at the weekend, no, but no. Ranfurly Shield rugby is much, much different. And on the day, um, if you turn up, you know that's 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 the key element. So it should be a fascinating encounter. Yeah, look, I want to break this chat down into a few different areas, and NPC being one of them. Um, just on that shield, though, geez, she looked fancy, dancy, nice new skirt on her <laughs> on the on the table on the weekend, mate. Yeah, they they the uh, New Zealand Rugby Union have done a really good job um, uh, doing the restoration of the shield and, and getting it back to exactly like it was back in the day. Um, you know, I, I must admit that uh, when, when we had the Ranfurly Shield back there in the mid-90s, um, we went out and celebrated after we managed to retain it a couple of times, and it was a bit worse for wear, so we had to give it to Chris England, um, who was working at a wood-turning business at the time, and he went and did a few repairs on it Brilliant. back in the day. So Brilliant. I do know for a fact that it has been repaired before because, yeah, we were a bit untidy with it. We probably didn't respect it as much as we should have a few beers, etc. cetera, been spilt on it. Yeah, and it ends up staying in people's houses, beds, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. It absolutely does, yeah. I've got to take it home. Many players do. And, uh, you know, back in that day, Marty, um, that was just before professionalism, they 94, 95, when we had the round 30 shield. Um, guys were still working. So they would take it along to their workplace and show it off yep. um, and places yep. like that. So yep. pretty cool. Yeah, look, and, and I remember when, uh, when uh, Taranaki won it in 96, and that was when, of course, the All Blacks were in South Africa and it went um, went to the um, uh, uh, the Slater's cow shed and spent a bit of time there, but also just taking <laughs> around schools. And it was also just one of those, because, you know, I was there when Wayne Smith scored in 82 and we lost the shield, didn't win it for 25 years. Once you get to see it again, I don't know, there's something kind of magical and special, you know, grown men wanting to come up and touch it, all that weird stuff. I love all that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, and it shows the history, but not over. Uh, not only that, the uniqueness of the shield. You know, it is not like no other trophy really in the world, to be perfectly honest. Um, we, we do have a real niche in what we've created with the Rand for the Shield. And equally, like when you think about it, many sides go a very, very long time where they don't get an opportunity to challenge for the shield. And so it seems to elude you in your playing career. So, yeah, you know, yeah. you think about the fact that you know, you've got to, when you get your opportunity, you've really got to make the most of it because you never know when that'll, when that'll come knocking again. Let's talk about this NPC then before we get on to the international rugby. Taranaki, top of the table. They've had four wins. Hawks played the same, and we played the audio there. Just a cracking game, a great finish to that game. Um, it's a real bummer that the crowds aren't there because what I've, the, the snippets that I saw in the games that I did watch over the weekend, I really enjoyed it. I thought the standard was actually excellent. I totally agree, and, and I certainly feel that the, the quality of, of the NPC, um, from what I've seen, has been of a high, of a high standard. Um, you know, I, I, the game that I did, and not but this is not including the ones that I watched, and I did watch that Otago Wolves Bay game. There were times when I was saying that 17, 18, 20 phases, and that was right. regular, yep. without errors. You know, so it goes to show that the ball maintenance is very good, but the fences are resilient as well, holding on for that amount of time under pressure. It means the skill level is really high. We're not seeing constant errors, so. I think that infiltration of, you know, the super rugby players, um, there's quite a high calibre of them obviously being uh, playing NPC now and they need to in case some of them are, who are just off the All Blacks um, get a call up. So, yeah, the, the, the standard is very high. It's been really good to watch and entertaining. I love seeing the players moving around, though. Good you playing for Northland especially. I mean, these kind of names, this is what we need. Yeah. That Northland side, what a result against Tasman. Did that really surprise you? Geez, they were good. Oh, it did, yeah. Now, I, I tuned in halfway through that game and I was very, very surprised at how dominant Northland were. You know, like, 
no doubt about the fact that you, you, you do lose some um, firepower when, when you when you take the likes of David Hobelli and Lester Fung and Luke Rady aside, but they're still a very good team, Tasman. But that Northland side, they just they just play a style of rugby that suits the players that they've got in that squad and in that team, and they're very entertaining. They're tough up front. They they will cause some headaches this year, and who knows where they could possibly go come end of. Uh, come finals time. Justin Marshall is with us. He's about to fly out, and you'll be at Twickers um, this weekend. Ian Foster and the All Blacks, we got to play our best team regardless, don't we? I absolutely think so. Look, let's, let's break it down. At, at the end of the day, the side that was going along with such rhythm, that beat South Africa comprehensively, went over to Melbourne, did a number there, and equally did a, a job on Argentina, would not have played since, I think, or Melbourne, which was around about the 27th or something um, of July. So they need a hit out, mate, because they all got rested for the game on the 5th of August in Dunedin. And then they will get a two-week break after they play on Friday, which is the 25th, uh, before they play France. So in, in, the, in, in the spell of about six weeks... You know, those players probably possibly would have only played two test matches. So, yeah, right. absolutely, they need to get out there. They need to play. Like, they haven't played enough up until the, uh, this Friday. So, yes, I absolutely feel that we need to get them out there. Maybe some guys um, like Lester Fyanganuku, who played so well in Dunedin, and possibly David Havili, who hasn't had his opportunity to make a mark on his Tuesday, will get opportunities. But the rest of it, I think, needs to stay the same as what it was in Melbourne. Justin, what do you say then, you know, to the argument that, oh, look, players can get injured and we could drop a guy in one of these games. Is that just an occupational hazard? Oh, mate, players can get injured at training. <laughs> like, look at what happened with the All Blacks in, in World Cup. You know, Dan Carter didn't get hurt playing a game. No, he good got point. hurt at training. Yes. It happens all the time. And you, you cannot put them in cotton wool because that's when they will get injured. The fact of the matter is someone like Aaron Smith, you know, we, we need him. He's valuable. We need him for the Rugby World Cup. He's probably the key player that we don't want to lose. But at the end of the day, he hasn't played any rugby in the last six weeks. And we need him on form and we need him playing well. And if the worst happens, that's when we adjust and adapt and just have to get on with it. But the good thing is, you lose someone in Aaron, like Aaron Smith, but the rest of the team have been playing together. So those 14 guys, when the new player comes in, they are in rhythm, they are in synergy, and the, the team doesn't um, falter as much because... They have been playing together, they're playing with confidence, and that player can slot in to a really good setup. I'm hoping when we get to the World Cup that we see Ian Foster with this attitude from France, and then the the, the, the next game is against Namibia. I don't care. I want to see the A team play. I want to see the A team play against yeah. Italy. And if you're going to give anyone yeah. a spell, then the game against Uruguay is perfectly placed before the quarter final. That's how I'd tactically approach it. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you, mate. We're on the same page there. Great. And look, if they want to give opportunities out, perhaps in the, even the Namibia game after a pretty torrid battle against France. You know, get that team back out there and then introduce that off the bench. Look, with the greatest respect, we could clear our bench at half time. Players can play multiple positions. We're still going to beat Namibia. Yes. You know, like it's yes, not the end man. of the world. Yeah. You could actually put all eight reserves on after 40 minutes and give that give eight players who you feel need it 40 minutes off. And if we need to adjust and adapt and push players around, Look at the Crusaders, mate. A couple of their games, I think they ended up playing with, what, 14 or 13 men, but they still managed to uh, get the job done because they were they were that good and they were that confident. International rugby over the weekend. Did you see Khaleesi chase after that Welsh guy? I mean, what knee injury? I did. Mate. Oh, mate. Yeah, he is a magical player, and I think, you know, the fact that he's been able to get himself fit and there was massive doubt whether or not he could, he's inspirational for South Africa, and doing those sorts of things is what that makes the rest of the players just want to play for him and, and play for their country. Um, you know, it's, he, he got a really good offload just close to the line, just uh, try assist. Um, yeah, he, he's he's back, and uh, that, that is a good thing for South Africa. Well, they were just awfully impressive, weren't they? Mightily impressive against Wales. And look, I don't know. You saw Pollard in the stand, whether he comes back. I don't know. I mean, this Welsh side is in all kinds of trouble, and they'd be very thankful for the draw that they've got. I mean, I don't even... Look, I, I could even see them actually getting upset. I think they've got Fiji in their group, haven't they? I could even see Fiji actually beating them. But that Springbok side, what do we read into that And and before we play them this weekend? Well, we've got to read a lot into it, which is, again, why I'm banging in the drum that we've got to get our strongest possible side that we can out there. Because at the moment, getting the wood on the Mount Smart, what we do not want them to do is come out again, if we put a B side out, like Australia 
we, we, like we did against Australia and we struggled. And all of a sudden, that juggernaut that is the Springboks that we are most likely to meet in a quarter final is all confident again. You know, do another Mount Smart on them. Yep. And, and then they'll be starting to scratch their head, regardless of what happens to them in their pool stages. Get to a quarter final against the All Blacks. They've been beaten twice by us already. We've figured them out. And all of a sudden, they're going to have to find some form of confidence and some different form of game plan to beat us because. We've beaten them twice already this year. But if we if we let them off the hook and give them a sniff, we know how good they are at World Cups. They know themselves well. They are a dangerous side. Ireland, Justin, everything, every time I watch them, and look, and I, I, I was watching, getting up watching Man United get dicked, and so I, I recorded that game and I watched it <laughs> after, uh, afterwards at Ford. You know, I didn't watch it at Ford, but I watched the United game at 420. I watched that one afterwards. And I tell you what, they impress me every time I watch them. I think that they're, they're just the tightness of the way that they play, the pattern that they play, they are ruthless. They seem to have strength and depth. They never let, never give a sucker an even break. They never take the pressure off, do they? I mean, since the Six Nations this year, I don't, I, I, I I can't find that much to criticise Ireland about or find fault with them. No, no, they, they are a very, very well-drilled side. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're functioning at the moment without Johnny Sexton being the architect as well. Uh, they've got good players across the board. Their back row, even when they lose a player, they can slot players in seamlessly. Um, you know, their front five is mobile, um, but yet tough. And, and they've got quality in the midfield, um, competition for places. Yeah, but they, they are impressive and... They are a very hard side to break down because defensively they're very good as well. They, they are such a good side that you know you, you feel like you're in the game, but to break them to break them apart um, when you've got the ball is, is not easy to do. So yeah, look, my my, my money um, for this tournament, obviously with my my All Black heart beating, is on the All Blacks. But if I was picking a team that I would like to see win it and enjoy to see win it, but equally who I feel could win it if it's not the All Blacks, it would be Ireland above all the other teams that are at that cup, including France. Well, I mean, let's just go through the... Re- I mean, you know, we don't want the Yarps to win it because they'd have more than us, OK? Um, you know, we hate England. I mean, we don't want Aussie to win. I mean, so it comes down to the, the team you kind of... You, you least hate the most, and I reckon that's them. I'm, yeah. and I'd, you know, look, if we can't Great. win it, I, I can't say I'd be happy with them winning it because I wouldn't be happy, but I'd say I'd be begrudgingly happy. Yes, I would too. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and you know, they are great people. They are great mates. Yeah, they're great crackers. Yeah. Who doesn't enjoy not, um, having a beer with them? They're really good people. And, they, and their rugby team is humble as well. Um, they're really well coached. Fans is a great guy. Um, look, equally, I guess a lot of people will probably have a, a little bit of sympathy for France. You know, they are they're, they're always the survivor, aren't they? They do well at Rugby World Cups, but they've never actually managed to, even being in finals and semi-finals, get them way to win a title. So, I guess there'll be a few out there thinking if it's not the All Blacks and if it's not Ireland, possibly France. But I agree with you on the rest. Stuff then. <laughs> yeah, so, so, sorry. A couple more questions for Luca. So I don't know what the England coach coaching group say to their players, but to see Vuna Pola do an Owen Farrell and do it again. I mean, it's you know, it was disappointing more than anything else. I mean, I mean that Irish prop must be made of granite, mate, because that hit him flush on the jaw and he kept going forward. But it's just it's dumb the, rugby, isn't it? Oh, it is, and particularly when you've seen the, the you know, the, the consequences and the scrutiny that you come under for high shots and, and getting your tackle technique wrong. And you know, it should have been a big conversation after what happened to Carol that they, they they went out there and made sure that they didn't lose any more really important players. Um, you know, and, and you, it's a discipline. The, the, the thing is, it's like we could think the same thing, and I, I heard people saying, oh, you know, we, we could lose players to suspension or we could lose players to injury. Look, mate, that's the way that the game is going to be refereed at the Rugby World Cup. So learn now. If you haven't learned now, then what's the point by saving people and not playing them because you're worried that they're going to get a red card mm. and they'll be out of the tournament? That's just, that's just stupid to think that way. The players know that that... that that their high shots will cost you red and possibly cost you more games. Get your discipline right. There's no amount of time to try and get it, get, get your head around it now. If you haven't got your head around it, and a classic example is England, then you'll face the full consequences. There's no matter standing down or not playing that, that will fix that. You've just got to get it right. All right, Justin, before uh, you go, the English rugby forwards habit of this ch- shouting and, and clapping and carrying on when they get a turnover or there's a, a line-out throw going wrong... I mean, you're the halfback. What are you saying to your forward pack? Lads, enough. Stop this. It's bollocks, mate, isn't it? Well, yeah, it is. Like, sort of screaming in people's faces. You know, that, that, that tends to always bite you. Um, and it's remembered as well. And, and, I, and I just feel that 
you know, rugby rugby is to a degree um, a game of respect, and when you're sort of rubbing people's faces in it, uh, when you, you when you very well haven't won anything, I think that's a bit on the nose. So, yeah, look, those those sorts of things have always been a little bit of a underbelly of English rugby, and um, not surprising that it's still there. Uh, but again, you know, if you're going to walk the walk, then you've got to you know stick your chest out and and, and go out and, and win big games. And at the moment, they're not doing that. So, yeah, I think they probably should. Calm then, calm there, cool their heels a little bit. All right, well, we've seen you in Paris. You're on the bird uh, this afternoon. So how does the trip go, mate? I mean, obviously, you know, you turn left when you get onto the plane, which is a luxury, of course. But at the time, so is it a 25-hour, 30-hour ride up there, or what is it? Yep, she's a she's a 32-hour ride um, going going through uh, Doha. So uh, I arrive in London on a Tuesday afternoon at 1.30, and you'll probably see me at a good old-fashioned English pub by about 3.30. Yep, yep. It's supposed to be 25 degrees, um, having a beer, knowing that the travel's done. So Yeah, that's it. I mean, look, uh, yeah, and the way to do it, to how do you actually do the jet lag, mate? I kind of like just do the time zone. If I arrive in the afternoon, I think, go out, have a pie, have some beers, get drunk, and then fall asleep yep. at night time and try and just clock in that way. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the, the point, is, point of the exercise is to make sure you try and slot into that time zone as much as you can, so... Yeah, a bit of food and a couple of a couple of beers, not too many, so that you're hung over and uh, usually you can get into things pretty quickly. A couple of sleeping pills on the plane if, if need be, and um, yeah, I'm pretty well schooled at it now, uh, Dev. So I'll give you the tips when you're about to come over later on, mate. We'll we'll, we'll sort of converse our information so that you hit the ground running. Thanks, brother. All right, we'll see you over there, Justin. Appreciate that enormously, mate. Thanks for talking to us. 17 minutes worth, bloody great. You're in the lounge and appreciate it very much.